Computers are fascinating. They can do multitudes of things, from simple mathematics onto handheld calculator, render real-time 3D scenes in a gaming machine, all the way to computationally heavy weather forecasting in a supercomputer. But at its core, it's all just ones and zeros. Binary. So how exactly does a computer work with just two numbers, and better yet, why? And what does it have to do with that? Well, we're gonna find out. Because today, we aren't reviewing a product. Rather, we're gonna take a tour of the beautiful yet bewildering world of technology in an effort to appreciate and understand it more. So I'm glad to have you here, so we can explore this labyrinth together. Welcome to the very first episode of Computer Concepts. It's time for Computer Concepts. Yeah. Let's start by talking about you. You are, presumably, a human. And as a human, it might seem like you're not doing much right now. After all, you're just kicking back by watching a video, right? Well, there are actually tons of things going on behind the scenes. Light from your screen is being received by your eyes, sound from the speakers is being received by your eardrums, and all of this information gets passed on through the respective nerves into your brain, which processes all of that to give you the sensation of seeing, hearing, and most importantly, understanding some dude talking to you from a screen. That's pretty smart in the grand scheme of things. Computers, on the other hand, aren't nearly as intelligent because at their base, they're just circuits. So how are we supposed to get from here to here? This is quite the dilemma, but it turns out the answer is the dilemma. Two possible choices, two possible states, on and off, are the easiest way we can manipulate a circuit. This is because on and off are complete opposites, whereas other parameters in a circuit are numerical values that fluctuate ever so slightly over time because of random external disturbances called noise. So you can never be sure that the current through this circuit is exactly as calculated because of this noise, but you can be absolutely certain that it is turned on. These on and off states can represent two things, either true and false values for logic operations, or for numerical calculations, one and zero. This is what's known as the base two number system, or binary, meaning of two things. And a single binary digit is called a bit, which is the basic unit of information for electronics. The basic unit of electronic devices are just fancy switches called transistors. They work like a physical switch, except they are activated by a current rather than a hand. And computer components like CPUs and GPUs are made up of billions of these microscopic switches arranged in clever ways for them to be able to process logic and numbers. But binary isn't actually as complex as you might think. It's just another way of counting. Take for example the counting system we're all familiar with, good old decimal. It's called decimal because deci means 10, and each digit of the decimal system has 10 possible values, 0 through 9. If I want to count beyond 9, I can simply add another digit to the left, reset my rightmost digit to 0, and keep on counting. Because we have 10 possible values per digit, each new digit represents an increase in powers of 10, from 1s, 10s, 100s, 1000s, and so on. In the number 238, for example, we have 2 100s, 3 10s, and 8 1s. It works the same way in binary, except now we only have two possible values per digit, 0 and 1. If I want to count beyond 1, all I have to do is add another digit on the left, reset my rightmost digit to 0, and I can keep on going. Because we have two possible values per digit, each digit is a power of 2 greater than the last, with 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s, and so on. So a number such as 11010 can be converted to decimal by multiplying each digit with its respective multiplier. The fifth digit with 2 to the 4, the fourth with 2 to the 3, the third with 2 to the 2, and so on. Add all those up together, and you have 26 in decimal notation. To convert this number back to binary, just divide it by 2, take the remainder out, and do this process over and over again until you get to 0. 26 over 2 is 13, no remainder. 13 over 2 is 6, remainder 1. 6 over 2 is 3, no remainder. 3 over 2 is 1, remainder 1. And 1 over 2 is 0, remainder 1. Reading the numbers from the bottom up gets you 11010. 
Now this 5-bit system can actually be applied in our daily lives. You know, I've always found hand counting tedious because you can only count till 5 on each hand. That is, until you realize that a hand can actually act as a 5-bit counter. Each hand has 5 fingers, or digits, with 2 possible values each, retracted or extended. This means that on one hand, you can't just count to 5. A 5-bit system would have 2 to the 5th or 32 possible values, 0 to 31, meaning that if you count in binary like this, you can count all the way up to 31. And if you include your other hand to add another 5 bits on top of that, you can count all the way to 1023, which is insane. By now though, you might be wondering how computers work with letters. After all, you can't just put a letter into the same calculation and have it spit out some binary value. Well, it turns out we don't have to. What we can do instead is just assign a unique code to each character in the alphabet for digital representation. This is called character encoding. ASCII, or the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, is a character encoding standard first published in 1963. It uses 7 bits to represent a total of 2 to the 7, or 128 characters. These include 95 printable characters, such as numbers, letters, and punctuation, as well as some control codes like horizontal tab and backspace. So let's say you open Microsoft Word. If you type in the letter A, your keyboard spits out the binary code of the letter A in ASCII to your computer. The computer then translates this code into a character, then sends that to your word processor that displays the image of the letter A in the current font. And this process will be the same for every other printable character in ASCII. ASCII, however, was limited by its character set, because apparently there are more languages than just English. Who knew, right? So today, we use Unicode, most commonly UTF-8, which uses 1 to 4 8-bit chunks, also known as a byte, to represent over a million characters. As you can tell, the number of things you can store as you add even more bits drastically increases, by a factor of 2 actually, for every new bit. However, this 2x multiplier brings up a couple of issues when we start getting larger and larger units. Metric prefixes are used everywhere to indicate multiples of a base unit, like kilometer or millisecond. And the prefixes are super easy to follow, where each unit just adds or subtracts a certain number of zeros from the base unit. But an interesting thing happens when you do the same with bit systems. You might think that a kilobyte is a thousand bytes, just like a kilometer is a thousand meters. And that's completely valid, because that's also its SI unit definition. However, computers work in powers of 2, so when counting to 1000 bytes, there is going to be just a little bit extra, 24 bytes to be exact. And so computers instead define 1 kilobyte not as 1000 bytes, but as 1024 bytes, which can also be called a kibibyte. So yes, there are two numerical definitions for one unit, which makes this quite confusing, especially because not everyone uses the same definition. When buying a 1TB SSD, for example, that terabyte is an SI units, which means it can store 1000 to the power 4 bytes of data. However, for a computer, 1TB is 1024 to the power 4. So when viewing your drive on Windows Explorer, your 1TB drive will appear to hold 931GB. But keep in mind, you aren't being scammed. Granted, it is misleading, but it is just a difference in units. However, this difference between decimal and binary units will get larger as your drive gets bigger, with 2TB drives actually holding 1.818TB in binary units, and 4TB drives actually holding 3.638TB in binary units. But wait a second, let's back up a bit here. If modern drives can hold terabytes and terabytes of data, how do modern CPUs only go up to 64 bits? Well, in a CPU, the number of bits isn't how much data the CPU can store, but rather how much data, specifically how many bits, it can work with at a given time. An 8-bit CPU means that it's physically wired to process 8-bit chunks of data. The ALU, or Arithmetic Logic Unit, is a CPU component that can do all sorts of math and logic operations. If an 8-bit CPU needs to add two numbers together, for instance, it would feed two 8-bit numbers into the inputs of its ALU and output another 8-bit number as the sum of the two inputs. 
Similarly, if an 8-bit CPU needs to fetch data from its memory, or RAM, it would first need to tell the RAM where to look for that data, and it does so by providing something called a memory address, which is essentially the location of that data within the RAM chips. And this is sent by the CPU to the RAM through a connection called the address bus. Each memory address can identify one byte of RAM, and so the amount of RAM a CPU can access is limited by the width of its address bus. An 8-bit CPU would use an 8-bit address bus, which can access 2 to the 8, or 256 memory addresses for an extremely underwhelming 256 bytes of RAM. This isn't very much at all, and it's why many 8-bit CPUs like the Intel 8008 use larger 14-bit memory addresses, allowing it to access a much more reasonable 16 kilobytes of RAM. Generally, the more bits a CPU can use for processing data, the better it will perform. It can handle larger calculations, use more complex instructions, and access more RAM, making it more efficient than a processor with fewer bits. However, we can't just keep adding bits to a processor willy-nilly. There is a limit to how much wiring we can physically fit into a CPU die. Plus, more wires make CPUs more convoluted, and it's just not worth it if we can't make use of that extra wiring. x86-64 is a 64-bit CPU architecture, and since its launch in 2003 in the AMD Opteron, it's found in almost every desktop and laptop processor today. You might think that because it works with 64 bits, it's able to store 64 bits of memory addresses for a mind-blowing 16 XB bytes of RAM. However, even today, we are nowhere close to reaching that limit, even on the most powerful servers, let alone when the technology was first developed. Because of that, x86-64 CPUs actually use the lower 48 bits to store memory addresses, rather than the full 64. This still provides a lot of headroom for future development, but it saves a ton on wiring and physical space, allowing chip manufacturers to fit more processors on a single silicon wafer, improving yields and reducing manufacturing cost. When we do approach that limit though, since x86-64 CPUs are already designed to work with 64 bits, chip manufacturers just need to integrate the extra wiring into their new CPUs to enable the full 64-bit memory addresses. For input and output devices though, the number of bits instead refers to their resolution, which is the smallest change that they can detect or display. This is called bit depth. The higher the number of bits, the smaller the difference in possible inputs or outputs, and therefore, the higher the resolution. Let's take monitors as an example. If you compare two images on a 6-bit panel versus an 8-bit panel, the 6-bit panel will have these sharp color changes called color banding, while the gradients on the 8-bit panel will look much smoother. This is because the 8-bit panel can reproduce 2 to the 8 colors for the red, green, and blue color channels, making a total of 16 million possible colors, while the 6-bit panel can only produce 2 to the 6 possible colors for each channel, making a total of 262,000 colors. Because the intermediate shades of what would have been a smooth gradient cannot be displayed by the 6-bit panel, you instead have these sharp color changes. The higher the bit depth on a monitor, the closer to real life its color production will get, and the better your experience will be. The same can be said for input devices like game controllers. Take this flight stick as another example. Its sensors have 14-bit resolution, which means it can detect 2 to the 14 or 16,000 different positions in each axis. If I took out the sensors and replaced them with ones with 10-bit resolution instead, we now only have 1,024 possible positions in each axis, making it far less precise since there's more play in between each position. The higher the bit depth, the smaller the changes the device will be able to detect, which is good. However, the same can't quite be said for solid-state storage. Bit depth in SSDs refers to how many bits one storage cell can represent, and therefore, how much data can be stored in one cell. You may have heard of SLC, MLC, and TLC. SLC, or single-level cell, means one cell can represent one bit. MLC, or multi-level cell, for two bits. TLC, or tri-level cell, for three. And QLC, or quad-level cell, for four. As a cell represents more bits, it does mean storage is denser and hence less expensive, but it also reduces performance. That's because for a cell to store many bits, you need more voltage levels to regulate, and it takes longer to read and write over 16 different voltage levels in QLC than just 8 in TLC. 
And this trend of lower cost and performance will continue with increasing storage densities, but we have yet to see anything higher than QLC at the time of filming. Now you could argue that SSD technology is getting worse if we continue in that direction. I have seen some videos that make excellent points, and I agree to some extent. In some form or another, technology has to get worse to get better. Research into making a technology as cheap as possible may seem like we're taking a step back at first, but if you really think about it, we all benefit. The technology is cheaper and accessible to more people, facilitating adoption and mainstream use, and the things learned from cutting corners could be used to make an overall product line better in succeeding generations, eliminating unnecessary steps or finding clever ways to overcome big hurdles. And that's the beauty of technology. It never stops developing, and there's always something new to discover. That's why I made this video the way that it is. I intentionally brushed over a wide range of topics with just enough detail to spark intrigue and motivation to learn more, while still keeping it short and sweet. There's just so much to absorb and so much to see that we can hardly cover even a fraction of everything in one sitting. As the foundation of computing, binary branches out into an ever-growing network of ideas and concepts so substantial, no one will ever understand all of it. And that's okay because as our circle of knowledge expands, so does the circumference of unfamiliarity. And together, we'll get through the darkness one video at a time. So thank you for joining me today. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.